in, uh, uh, I think, early 2010, there was a documentary that came out that um, was by this just unknown filmmaker. He was, he was actually a film student at the time. His name was Ariel Schulman. Um, and it was a, a documentary uh, that, that started and went a different di di direction than originally planned. Ariel's little brother, who was like 18, 19 years old at the time, had met a girl online, and she was incredible. Um, she was a, 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 like an interpretive dance person in New York, and um, just, just seemed like a great match for him. Um, and through time, had gotten to know her, um, met her initially online, but then got to know her through phone calls and all of that. Um, and so they decided to do this documentary on his, really, his getting to know this woman and then falling in love at, and yet met, not having ever met her and then meeting her and then getting married and all of that. So they start this documentary. Through the process, they find out that this woman doesn't actually exist. That in fact, that in fact, she was a 40-year-old married woman um, who never had any intentions of getting divorced from her husband but that all along she was just kind of playing with, with his heartstrings. And, and so this was an exploration of that sort of thing happening. This happened in, in 2010. And as part of that, they called that documentary Catfish. The reason why they called that documentary Catfish was when they were interviewing this woman, trying to figure out, okay, so what was your motivation in this? What were you getting out of this? How, how did you benefit from this? And why did you lead him along and walk through this whole process? And, um, and, and in that interview, she was there with her husband, and her husband said of her, she is a catfish. And they were like, what, what in the world does that even mean? Like, what catfish, right? Like, um, and, and, and he based it on a story he had heard one time of when shippers were trying to send live cod a different kind of fish, cod, a across the country in tanks. And they, they would ship these cod, but by the time they got there, they would be dead or they would be lifeless and colorless, like there was no energy left in them. They were near death. And so what they started doing, according to him, was they would put a live catfish in with the cod in order that it would just like nip at their fins and, and cause them to um, arrive really stressed out but much more energetic and alive. And so, um, and as he said, she is that to me, and she is that to other people. She finds something in that. From that documentary in 2010, after they called it catfish, that word in particular began to mean a very specific thing. Catfishing is when we pretend digitally to be somebody other than we actually are in order to gain something from someone else online. People do this all the time. Right now, there's a documentary on Netflix that was released earlier this year about a different person who was doing something like this. It's called Tinder Swindler. And when I mention that, I, I haven't watched it. So if you go and check it out, like maybe be careful. Um, Pastor has not given his uh, stamp of approval on that one. Um, but it's about this guy who pretended to be like the son of Israeli billionaire diamond producing company, um, the Leviebs. And he pretended that on Tinder met women. He would take them on like a private jet, which he didn't own. Um, but he would take them on a private jet and he would show them how rich he was. And then he would swindle them for like tens of thousands of dollars. Take that person's money in order to do that to the next person, right? To pay for the plane and all of that. And he kept doing this thing. And it, was, it became this big deal, the Tinder swindler. And then there was another um, TV show that came out that was called Inventing Anna. And again, I don't, I'm not... Like, no stamp of approval. I don't know what this show is like. But it's about this other woman who did the exact same thing in New York with, like, the cream of the crop, the, the most rich people in New York, all the socialites. She pretended to be a German heiress, and her name was Anna Delvey, or she pretended to be this German heiress named Anna Delvey, and, and, and like, took everybody in, and everybody fell in love with her, and they all loved her, and then they find out that she didn't actually have money like them, and then they were all offended, and... You don't have money, and we have money. And, and, and this thing is a thing. And it's not just a thing out there on Netflix. There are two separate older women in this church 
that I've personally talked to and I love, and some who are, one who's in here and one who's joining online right now, who have been taken in by men online on Facebook, like attractive men who said, hey, I just want somebody to talk to. And, and then it, it, they try to, to form a relationship, and it's always a handsome older man with a full head of hair. And they came to me and they said, they said, hey, I don't know what's going on with this. What do you think? And I said, block. Because that's, it's happening right now. Just two weeks ago, KY3 had a, 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 a story on in northwest Arkansas. 10 to 14-year-old boys were being taken in online by somebody who was pretending to be a 10 to 14-year-old girl who would start by sending inappropriate pictures to them and then ask them to send inappropriate pictures back. When that happened, they find out it wasn't actually a 10 to 14-year-old girl, but that it was somebody who then took those pictures and threatened to expose them to the world if they did not get a hold of their parents' credit cards and share that information with them. This all just happened just 50, 100 miles south of us in northwest and north Arkansas. This kind of stuff happens all the time where there's somebody who pretends to be someone else, and it happens more for Gen Z than anyone else. Gen Z in particular is is what's known as, if you've never heard this phrase, a digital native. If you've never heard of the phrase digital native, they have grown up in a world where you have an opportunity to project a different vision or version of yourself digitally than maybe you are in reality. And you can put anybody out there and you can be whoever you want. But this is not just a Gen Z thing. This is a Gen all of us thing. Every single one of us to some degree is guilty of catfishing. There is the, the person who I am, but then there is a, an image of who I am that I project separately. And all of us are guilty some way of doing that. Pretending to be somebody we're not. I want to turn to Ephesians chapter 2. So grab your Bibles and open them up to Ephesians 2 this morning. Um, I'm just going to read a couple of verses there as we continue this series on identity with this focus on catfishing. Um, There's a chunk of scripture there that we've kind of talked around for the last several weeks, but I want to just address directly. And I don't have too much time today, but I do want to take a moment and I want to talk about this idea. This idea of our identity versus our image. Our identity, who we are, versus our image, who we project, right? Um, And and I don't know if you've ever had an interaction with somebody where at all initial kind of introductions, everything seems to be great. And you're like, man, this person is awesome. I love everything about them. You, you, You are interacting with them, and you're like, man, these people have it together, And then over time, somewhere along the line, maybe you get a little peek behind the curtain and you find out that that's not actually reality. Have you ever met somebody like that? Are you somebody like that? Here's a good way to know. If your life cycle at a church or somewhere else where you get to know people, a job, whatever, friendships, is like two to three years long and you cycle over and over and over again, It may be that there is some dissonance in your heart between who you project and who you are. So be aware. Stop and ask, how often do I change churches? And if it's every two years, you might ask yourself why. Because it may be that you're projecting one thing, and as people get a peek behind the curtain, it starts making you feel uncomfortable, and it's time to move on. I'll just throw that out for free. That wasn't in my notes. It is a jarring experience, though, when you get to know somebody... You find out, in reality, they're not who they pretend to be. It's jarring. It's, uh, it causes dissonance. It, it can be shocking for us. And in Ephesians, Paul talks about who we actually are. And it causes for us an opportunity to step back and look at the foolishness of projecting something other than who we are. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, he's having a larger discussion about new life, the new life we've been given, which is actually the next series we're going to do. What that actually means when you hear, oh, I've got new life. What does that mean? Well, we're going to talk about that. That's our next series we're going to kick into in just a bit. Um, And that's going to be such a good series. As part of that, we're going to have an interview. One of those 
uh, Sundays with somebody who is, unless God intervenes, um, soon to die. And, um, and what that looks like, looking at your own death in light of eternal life. Um, that's going to be a rich, rich series. And so I encourage you to join us for that as well. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. This is such a, a rich passage. Because all of us essentially want to be special. We want to be someone important. And so we work towards that. That's kind of natural, right? Um, uh, but in reality, God's design is backwards of that. He says, listen, I created you, which gives you value. And not only did I create you, I love you, which gives you value. value. And then he says, I saved you in Jesus Christ. In Christ, you are the righteousness of God. That gives you value. And none of those things are things that you have earned. Instead, they are things that I gave you as a gift. So I gave you value as a gift. Have you ever worked someplace where you had a boss who would take credit for the things that you did? No, nobody ever had that. Okay, cool. <laughs> Pastor Nathan, can you share with them? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just, um, I do try to be that boss uh, with God all the time. All the time. I try to be the boss who takes credit for the things that he has done for me. And what he says here is that this is not stuff that you get credit for. I'm the one who did this as a gift to you. I gave you value. But I try to get that backwards all the time. And I think many of us do where we get it backwards where we're trying to earn something that he has already given us because we're trying to gain value by our own, like by our own effort, if that makes sense. If I work towards this thing, then that inherently gives me value. If I gain something by my blood, sweat, and tears then I am a valuable person. But God says, that's not how this thing works. I gave you as a gift these things, and that inherently gives you value. And then the things you do, you do as a result of that. And then we get it backwards over and over and over again, and all of it doesn't really make sense. He, we get it backwards, we get it twisted. He keeps telling us, you've already got the value. Don't try to live up to the gift, live out of the gift. That's part of what we talked about last week week and in Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 and 13 it says work out your salvation for it is God who works in you to will and to work according to his good pleasure take the things that he has worked in you and work those things outward but you see it most clearly this idea of the dissonance or or the incredible gift that God has given us in the very next verse here's what it says about you and about me and who we are because of who God is and what he has done for us Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says this for we are God's masterpiece he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago what a statement what a statement. He really says four things. He says, um, uh, we are, he has, so we can, and he planned. But he says, I did these things for you. And it begins with the fact that he made you and he made me a masterpiece. And that word masterpiece is only used in one other verse. In Romans chapter 1, verse 20. And there it's talking about all of creation. And it says there that all of creation is his masterpiece. In other words, that it points to the artist. That as we look at creation, that you cannot but stop and think, there was a creator. And, and as that happens, it results in glory back to him. He talks about you and about me in the same way he talks about the rest of his creation. He says, you are my masterpiece. And as people look at you, it brings attention to me. It brings glory to me. And then he says, not only did I make you, I also remade you. He said he created us anew in Christ Jesus. Do you know something weird? I have started using the word journey. Several years ago, <laughs> Pastor Ashton used, that's like his number one word. If you look at the words that Ashton uses, journey is up there. What's the other one? What? Awesome. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I hear that. I hear that. Um, anybody else we can roast here? No, I'm just kidding. Um, but I hated the word journey two to three years ago. 
Um, I even, I think I preached a sermon on why I hate the word journey. Um, I think, I think that's how that went or something like that. I can't remember exactly. But a couple of weeks ago, um, Pastor Nathan actually pointed out to me. He said, have you noticed how much you're starting to use the word journey? And so that, that resulted in the separation. Um, and uh, <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and he was, I was like, you're right. It's true. I hated when people would talk about this journey called life. I, oh, ah, like, like on, the, on the chalkboard of my soul. It was fingernails. And yet, the thing is, we are all impacted by the people who are around us. Not one of us is static, right? Like, we don't, we don't stay exactly who we have been. We all are changing constantly. I am not who I was two years ago. You are not who you were two years ago. If, you, if nothing else, with, through the pandemic, when you see somebody after the pandemic, you're like, wow, how much has changed in the last year or two? You know what I'm saying? Like, there's not... One of us is static. We are all changing. I guess in a way you could call it like a journey of life. And so I've noticed that that's the case. Where did that come from? It came from, I mean, I have been impacted by the people I spend the most time with. And that is the people I worked with. So it is Pastor Ashton. It is Pastor Heather. And yet just in the last year or two, they have impacted and changed me. Pastor Nathan over the last seven years has impacted and he has changed me. And this is how God always intended this to be, that there is interaction which changes every single one of us, that not one of us is static, that we are all constantly moving and changing because of our interaction with one another. And all of it God uses to make me more who we always intended originally for me to be, his masterpiece, which means that All those things, some of those things that I don't like physically, mentally, emotionally, intellectually, he is making, he has made, and he is making me anew. And this is the same for you, whether you feel it or not, that God said, you are my masterpiece. And there are things that you may not like physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, but he's still doing something in you, and he is using other believers to do that. And he is doing that just directly by his Holy Spirit on a daily basis. And if it is God who made you who you want to, or he, who he called you to be, maybe those things you don't like you should embrace a little bit more fully. Did you know that teenage girls are 12 times more likely to, to die as a result of an eating disorder than any other disease? 30 million Americans have an eating disorder today. That's like 10%. There's a problem here. We have an issue with our image of ourselves and who we think we should be and who we are. And ultimately, a lot of this, I think, comes down to dissonance between our identity and our image. Our identity is the me that God created and made me to be. Image is the me I present to the world. And when those things are in dissonance with one another, when they don't match up, that it creates all kinds of issues inside of us. And we have all kinds of reasons why we do this. And ultimately, I'm not asking you to verbally puke over every person every day. I'm not asking that. What I am asking is, is there a difference between the image you project and the identity that you hold? And maybe part of the issue is that you believe things that are untrue about yourself. And that identity is not something that you have fully embraced. Some of this, I think, comes down to our feed, right? We look at how successful other people are in our feed and how great their vacations are and how well their kids pose for photographs. And you think, those kids must stand like that all the time. And that photo did not require any threatens, uh, threats or any kind of strangling or, you know. Um, and we see that. And we think they're so happy. Speaking of documentaries, there was a documentary that came out earlier last year. I don't know if anybody saw this one. This one I can say, hey, this is a good one. Um, It's called Made You Look. Has anybody seen this? It's so good. So good. Oh, it's good for the soul. Made You Look is about um, this, uh, well, it's about this uh, New York art gallery, prestigious New York art gallery, um, and one of the greatest art frauds of all time. So, Essentially, there was this art gallery uh, where somebody approached, this woman approached and said, I am a representative of a billionaire, 
and I want to sell some of his previously unreleased art collection. And so they said, okay, bring, bring a piece. And they brought this piece that was like a Jackson Pollock, this famous artist. And, and, and it was an unknown piece that had never been seen before. And so this art gallery said, okay, we've never heard of this piece that Jackson Pollock did. And they said, yeah, well, it's a billionaire. I mean, they have things that you've not heard of. And, blah. and, and so the, the person says, okay, let me bring in some experts. The experts all say, yeah, 100%, this is a Jackson Pollock. No doubt about it. Expert after expert after expert. All the experts agree this is an original. So they sell this thing for like $5 million, $10 million, something like that. And over 10 years, this person kept bringing pieces of art and selling it off to billionaire after billionaire after billionaire, all of these previously unreleased works of art. And it went on for 10 years. There were um, tens and hundreds of millions of dollars that were invested into this. After 10 years, they find out all the paintings were fake that it was actually done just by this Chinese math professor. And he had started painting these as part of an imitation and his love for these famous artists. And somebody came along and said to him, dude, those are so good. You could get away with selling those as originals. And so that's how it went. And so for over 10 years, there's just this math professor who is painting all of these different artists and taking in all of the experts. And all of the experts agreed. And the, the art institution started selling these to billionaires everywhere. The reason why this documentary is so good, number one, is you get to see a lot of snobby people look really stupid. And that's always good, you know? And you get to see a lot of billionaires lose a lot of money. And all of those things are good for the soul, you know? Like, <sighs> sucker! You know what I'm saying? Like, <sighs> I feel better about myself, you know? But how do billionaires who are good with money, right? You don't get to be a billionaire without being good with money taken in. How are all of these experts taken in? And all of them agree. These are original pieces of art. That's part of the joy of the whole thing. And, and so I encourage you to check it out. It's good stuff. Um, but as part of that, you know, we do that on a regular basis. We look and we see and all of us agree this person, man, they have it all together and others see the feed too. I don't know if the Facebook algorithms have gotten me, and they've, they've, they've gotten my wife, too. Um, I don't know if you've seen on Facebook, they have the reels. Have you guys, this is their attempt to underdo, t undermine TikTok. Anytime somebody comes up with something original, Facebook mocks it, or not mocks it, does their own version of it, which isn't as good. Anyways, so this is their version of TikTok. It's the reels that show up. I don't know any of the people in the reels. They aren't my friends, but it's just like a feed of reels that are just random videos you can watch that's sometimes 30 seconds, minute long. Anyways. So the algorithms have locked me in. For Liz, they've locked her in too. I hope you're okay with me sharing this story. Am I good with that? <laughs> if, if not, like, what are you going to do? Throw something at me? You'll hit somebody in front of you. Like, all right. So for her, her feed is like people shopping at thrift stores. Like, hey, look at this deal I found at a thrift store. And it, like, that's her. Like, the algorithms have nailed her. For me, it's always football. And it's like highlights of football. And so it's like two or three plays, and they're like, the title is always something like, man, Mahomes can throw the ball. <laughs> and it always gets me. I click on it every time, and I watch it, and I'm like, oh, wow, he can throw the ball, right? <laughs> but here's the thing about highlights. When you're watching highlights, you're seeing the best of the best. You can make anybody look good with highlights, except for the Dallas Cowboys. There's no way you can make them look good. Like, but, but everybody else, like you can make the Chicago Bears look good with highlights. Like, you just clip one or two or three plays that were their best plays. You know what they don't show? All the misses. You know what they don't show? All the times in practice that they hit the guy in the back of the head. Like, they don't show the stuff where in the locker room, where they were fighting over the fact that they missed the play again. They show the one time that it worked perfectly. And when we compare ourselves and our hidden selves, the things we know about ourselves, to someone else's projected image, then what we're doing is we're comparing our behind the scenes with their highlight reel. And that will always, always cause problems. Because the projected vision of that person is not the, the depths of the things that they're struggling with on a regular basis basis. So then we start pretending to, and when we pretend, we become an imaginary person. And what does that do to the masterpiece that God made you to be? 
What does that do? Well, let me give you some things. When we start pretending, no one really likes you. When you start pretending, no one really likes you. Hate to break it to you, but that is the most self-proving statement you can come up with. No one really likes you because nobody even really knows you. It is not possible for someone to like you if you are pretending on who you actually are. Because they don't even know the real you. How can they decide if they really like you? The very best they can like is the fake you. Because people are getting the fake you and they don't even have a chance to get to know the real you. And until you are authentic with who God made you to be, no one can really know you. And if they cannot really know you, then they cannot really like you. Self-proving statement. If you're faking it, nobody likes you. Okay? When we start pretending, we stop growing. When we start pretending, we stop growing. That passage in Philippians 2 that talks about work outward your own salvation. For it is God who works in you to will and to work according to his good pleasure. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, passages in the Bible. Because it speaks so quickly and so clearly about what God, how God moves in us and how he expects us to move as a result of that. Well, that doesn't work if we don't like what's going on inside of here. And if we create a disconnect between what's happening out and what's happening in, then there is no room for that growth to happen. If you are pretending you are not growing, it stops you from growing. Even more scary, though, when we start pretending... It affects our connection to God. One of the things God calls us to is a sincere faith. And you will never have a sincere faith if you do not have a sincere you. James chapter 5 verse 16 says, Confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Do you see the need for confession here? Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. That there is a connection between the real me, the area where I need to confess, and God moving in my life, healing. That if we create a fake us and we put on a show and we aren't confessing, that it can come in between us and God. You hear me on that? That's real. It happens. And so here's what we're going to do. Everybody turn to somebody who's not a spouse and confess your deepest, darkest sin. And then have them confess it back. But don't go first, okay? Um, no, this isn't the place for that. You can't do that here in this room. Where does that have to happen? It has to happen in deep relationships where there is trust and the authentic you is seen. Where you can say, here's who I am and here's what I'm struggling with and I need your help to pray for me and this thing. That's where that happens. It happens in deeper relationships where people actually know you. And if people don't actually know you, it can never happen. And so when we start pretending, it affects our connection to God. Let's go back to that passage of Ephesians chapter uh, 2 verse 10. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. What? So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. When we start pretending, it interferes with our purpose. You being who you are, according to that verse, you being who you are is the fuel for doing what God called you to do. You are God's masterpiece. Created. Of, or we are, he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things that he has called and planned for us long ago. Where does that come from? It comes out of the fact that God has called you and, and spoken over you and created you and he has remade you. And when you interfere with that reality and it impacts your ability to do what God put in front of you, what he planned long ago for you to do. You need to be the authentic you in order to do what he has called you to. So don't fake it. A few weeks back I talked about like a fish in water not knowing what wet is. Have you ever been at a pool and you stuck your toes in and you're like, there's no way I'm getting in that. That is so cold, I'll have hypothermia within the first minute. You'll have to airlift me so I don't lose my toes. There's no way I'm getting in that water. And then slowly you do. You dip your toes and then your foot. Before you know it, you're fully in the water. Once you're in the water, you're like, I am never getting out of the water. 
because it is so cold out there that I will get hypothermia within the first minute. You'll have to airlift me so I don't lose my toes. Like once you get into it, it's hard to get out of it because all the things that you thought, man, that's, that's, that I don't want to get into it for that reason, are all the things that now you feel based on where you are. When we put on a show, every now and then there's like an authentic us that pops up. And as we do that, there is always the fear that someone's going to come along and smack that down. So then we go on pretending. But there has to be a space for us to introduce people to who we are. Because otherwise what happens is we keep faking it. We keep concealing. You may be feeling dry or drained or in a tough season. And you're just like, oh man, everything's good. It's all good. And this is the part where I sing. And this is the part where I raise my hands. And this is the part where I close my eyes and pray. And this is the part where I say amen. And we go through the actions. And all of that is just so dumb. It's so dumb. Because God gave us the church for another reason. That in the church, we can be broken. And in the church, we can say, here's where my struggles are today. And that we can be praying for one another and bearing one another's burdens. This is why he gave us the church. And yes, I know, this may not be the place for it. And walking through the hallways, hey, how was your day? May not be the place for you to verbally puke on somebody. Right? I get that that's not. But you need to have a space where that is real. And you have that opportunity. And that's part of why we even do our small groups, which are launching this week, and I'm so excited about it. Man, there are small groups for every age. I don't, if you're single, if you're married, if you're a college student, or if you're retired and, and the kids are out of the house, or if, if um, uh, uh, wherever you are in life, like that's for you. And I'm not saying that, that you need to verbally puke every time in small group either, but those relationships that are formed there, the problem with how sometimes we think fellowship should look as a church is that we're sitting here and we're scratching an itch when heart surgery is necessary. We say, oh, I just did fellowship. No, you didn't. You, you just had coffee. What real fellowship looks like is, hey, I'm struggling in this area and others praying with you and then checking in with you and saying, hey, how's that going? A place where you can say, man, I really stunk at being a, a dad this week. And I, I just need prayer right now. And other people do not condemn you for it, but instead surround you and lift you up and participate with you in that. Here's what I'm saying. There's a difference between image and identity. God made you who you are. Don't project something else. Because if you do, it interferes with every area of your life. And what will end up happening is you will find a cycle, just like I said. Every two to three years, you'll need to move on. Because people will start to get a peek behind the curtain, and it will freak you out. Because all these years, you've been putting on a front, putting on a show, and that's not the real you. Next week, we're going to talk about how to find the authentic you according to Scripture. in the Mirror Maker, that's the wrap-up to this series. How to know who you really are, the authentic you, after you bring it all together. The fact that he made you in all of your intellect and in all of your struggles. He has made you his masterpiece and he is continually making you his masterpiece. The fact that he created you, the fact that there is sin that has marred you. The fact that he is remaking you in Christ Jesus and you are holy. All of those things brought together, who are you? That's next week, which is the wrap-up to this series. Here's where we're at. Man, you need to be in those types of relationships. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying that it comes quickly. What I am saying is that it's necessary. And if you don't, what will happen is it will interfere with your growth. It will interfere with your relationships. It will interfere with your ability um, to uh, stay in one place for a while. I'm going to invite you to stand with me.